résumer la Bibranche avec vous aujourd'hui, je dirais que c'est d'abord des rencontres. Des rencontres entre étudiants appartenant à différents laboratoires, différentes entreprises, mais aussi avec des chercheurs venant du monde entier. Nous accueillons tous les étudiants appartenant au domaine de l'électronique, au sens large. Nous donnons la possibilité à ces étudiants membres de créer leur réseau professionnel dans des domaines qui leur tiennent à cœur. Être membre Vibranche, et donc membre I3E par extension, cela vous donne beaucoup d'avantages. Notamment, vous aurez accès à une grande librairie d'articles de conférences en électronique, mais aussi à l'actualité des dernières technologies et aux événements organisés par les entreprises de France. Mais avant tout, cela vous permet de faire partie d'une des plus grandes communautés scientifiques mondiales. Et tout cela pour seulement 20 dollars. Sur le campus Bordelais, on organise des événements à peu près tous les mois, sur place ou sous forme de virtual event, au cours desquels on a des invités tels que des chercheurs. Mais on permet aussi aux étudiants du campus Bordelais de transformer leurs projets d'études en projets I3E, en ayant un soutien financier et nous les accompagnons aussi dans l'écriture d'articles scientifiques afin qu'ils aillent en conférence par la suite. Être à la Vibranche, c'est faire partie d'une équipe dynamique et soudée pour promouvoir la science. Pour moi, la Vibranche, c'est l'occasion et l'opportunité de changer son quotidien d'étudiant. C'est l'occasion d'organiser tout plein de choses, des séminaires, des journées thématiques ou encore des concours technologiques autour de divers sujets scientifiques. Rejoignez la Vibranche. Tiens, la Vibranche. Donc rejoignez tous la Vibranche. On était à la Vibranche. On est à la Big Branch. definitely changes your life. It helps you establish relationships that are really tighter because you already have a lot of things in common in the way you think, work, want to change the world around you. As, as you get involved in IEEE, you, you really get a sense that you want to give back and to grow the community that you have. I think there's a natural intersection between IEEE and its role in promoting the emergence of new technologies and entrepreneurship. IEEE was a great uh, channel to get to connect with professionals in the field. You never know what's going to happen when you meet so prominent people that are foreseeing the future. What has IEEE brought me? I've, I've worked full-time in, in power system automation, which we call Smart Grid, for over 41 years now, full-time. And the job changes I've made were through industry friends that knew of opportunities that I wouldn't have known otherwise and opened up the door for me. And many of these industry friends I met through IEEE. What other place can you try to take a risk of doing our presentation skills and bringing in somebody from industry to talk to other scientists and engineers? I've been a member of IEEE for 25 years and I still talk and mentor about this to this day. IEEE has given me opportunities to network in terms of getting to know the leaders in the field and also has provided an outlet for those leaders to know what I'm doing. So uh, it's been um, uh, good for both of us. Given the world that we're living in now, where everything is pretty much about the internet and, and about connectivity, um, it's, it's actually a good time to be um, an engineer and to be a telecommunications and networking engineer. We know it's about the dynamics between people and people groups where our future is. And engineers can facilitate that, but they don't have the answers. It's the answering of us together as a community, not as engineers alone. So engineering is not going to solve the world, but it's going to facilitate. That, uh, that problem solving and getting together. At IEEE, we believe technologists are the key drivers of tomorrow's innovation because we can really do what IEEE's motto states. We can advance technology for the benefit of humanity. I always wanted my education to mean something more than just, you know, um, doing a day job that pays my checks. I wanted to see how my background in engineering and other things could have an impact that can make somebody's life better. Being able to connect our members with younger students and engaging them 
to emphasize that it is important that what they are pursuing in their STEM careers is truly going to be the next thing that affects all of humanity because all technology that we make is affecting people and it's not just IEEE members, it's everybody. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Jean Michel. Okay. Uh, I think Andres has a, a problem with his mic, so maybe I, I can uh, uh, introduce you. The time he's going to fix the the mic, and we have already uh, ten people uh, online. So. <laughs> Let's uh, let's say a few words. The uh, time for Andres to fix uh, his mic. Uh, so tonight it's uh, it's a, a sincere pleasure to welcome Professor Jean-Michel Redouté. Uh, it's a long story uh, between uh, between uh, Jean-Michel uh, and Bordeaux, and it started uh, eight years ago uh, when I met uh, Jean-Michel at Melbourne in Australia, and it was a starting point a starting point of a collaboration uh, as we designed circuits together, uh, a starting point of a friendship as we shared good times uh, together, and also a starting point of a mutual trust as I'm honored to be a Jean-Michel's daughter godfather. In terms of science, uh, Jean-Michel has a wide spectrum of expertise in electronics. He likes uh, electromagnetic compatibility and also bioelectronics. But just can you imagine that our first circuit uh, we designed together was named Corona. We were so yes. trendy in advance. So Jean-Michel uh, worked in Australia and now is back in his birth country, Belgium, as professor at Liège. So what could be better, the best match uh, to give a talk at Bordeaux when you come from Liège? I mean that you have the bottle uh, from Bordeaux, la bouteille, and the cork, the bouchon, reunited. So Jean-Michel, again, I would like to thank you for your talk today. So I do not know if uh, Andres has fixed uh, the mic now. No, we cannot hear you, Andres. So maybe uh, you can start uh, your talk, uh, Jean-Michel, and I'm gonna ask uh, how you to switch to uh, the presentation mode. Sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Andres, is that you? Yes, I, sorry, I had a problem with my mic. So, no, no problem at all. I mean, these things. Doesn't okay. matter. Okay. So, now, um, welcome to this uh, student chapter talk. Uh, as Professor Francois told before, um, now we have a um, so, uh, Professor Jean-Michel Redoute from University of Liège in Belgium. Then 
uh, we will have some other talks along the month of December. So the next talk will be um, Professor Shoi from the Case University in, in Korea. Then uh, uh, Victor Greenblatt for Synopsis in Chile. Then uh, uh, Professor David Alstott uh, from Oregon State um, in the USA. And then uh, the 15th of December, uh, Thibaut Dixon from uh, UC Leuven in, Be in Belgium. In Belgium, sorry. Uh, now, we, in the next talk, we, as I told before, uh, Professor Choi in Belgium, in Korea, sorry, talking about green oscillator PLL. It's a very interesting talk. Uh, then the chapter in the IEEE, in the Rio Grande do Sul chapter, we'll, we will see the, the talk of Mr. Jan Rabai from UC Berkeley and IMEC in Belgium. Uh, about the brains of computers. Now we also would like to, to uh, ask you to send some papers uh, to the conference in the IMS conference. Uh, the deadline is the 9th of December. Also for INSCAS 2021, uh, which will be in the next year, May, May next year. And also, finally, we will um, have the seasonal school uh, on circuit and systems for IoT in Bordeaux in June 2021. So please um, stay tuned for that. So now I would like to to give uh, the speech uh, to Professor Jean Michel Redoute. Uh, he will give his talk uh, about radiation and circuits. Um, so let me wait a minute, please. Uh, We have the So today we, I will introduce uh, Professor Jean-Michel Redoute uh, to, this, to his talk um, about uh, combating electromagnetic interference, interference using circuit techniques. Jean-Michel Redoute received uh, the degree of uh, MS Master in Electronics from the University of Antwerp in Belgium and the in in 2012, and in August 2001, he started working at Arcatel Bell in Antwerp in Belgium. Then in 2009, he, he did his PhD thesis entitled Design of MAI Resistant Analog Integrated Circuits. Um, and then he started working at the, in the Berkeley Wireless Research Center at the University of California in Berkeley. So now his research is concentrated in miniaturized low power sensor interface at the laboratory at the University of Lech as an associate professor from 2018. So welcome Professor Jean-Michel Redoute and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me, Chanon la gorge, like they say in French. Uh, thank you for the very nice words. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for inviting me as well, and I'm happy to present my work and talk specifically about 
combating electromagnetic interference using circuit design techniques. Once in a while, I'm looking there because I've got YouTube as well in that link, so I can see myself. It's slightly disconcerting. So um, yeah, the outline of the talk will be as follows. So I'll give a brief research overview about my work, introduce myself, um, like the type of research I do, and then talk about uh, the laboratory I'm working in at the University of Liège. Then, uh, very important, I'll well, I'll talk about two ways, I think, to start a presentation about EMC, and we can then choose whatever way is the best one, I guess. Uh, after that, we'll talk about EMI issues uh, on a PCB perspective, So, but circuit design techniques. So we're not going to talk about shielding or, or um, like Faraday cages and so on, but really uh, trying to fix electromagnetic interference, so EMI, I'll use EMI throughout the talk, to uh, fix issues on a PCB. And then we'll extrapolate actually uh, towards integrated circuits. And then it will be time to conclude the talk. So I'm working at the Microsys lab at the University of Liège. So Microsys, you see actually at the top a photo, it's a fisheye. So it looks actually very big and it is quite big. It's our clean room, it's 200 square meters. And it's more of a packaging facility. Uh, inter so we do interconnection there. We design advanced packaging. Uh, very, use, very useful for us to, to package the miniaturized electronic circuits that we work on. And a couple of uh, research teams of Microsys are connected sensor systems, energy harvesting, very low power electronic devices, like for instance, sensor nodes. Uh, we also do design of miniaturized, also microelectronic circuits, and then microassembly, which I said before. Now, most of the funding of Microsys comes from funding, local funding from the Walloon region in Belgium, or European projects, uh, interact projects, and so on. So basically for Microsys, we've got, well, we, we go through the entire chain, let's say, of design. We try to do as much as we can ourselves. So from design to development, to the modeling simulation, microassembly, interconnection, and then uh, finally testing our prototypes, the most exciting times of all when it works, I guess. So um, yeah. so. Aside from these projects and, and these uh, competences and research that I talked about in this work, I also got my research as an academic, uh, so more like research projects and PhD researchers working on these topics. And the uh, first one is electronics. You see it at the bottom here, electronics and sensors for biomedical applications. We've got on-chip electromagnetic compatibility, which is going to be the object of the talk today. And then 3D SPAD-based imagers, so for measuring depth so really depth sensors, 3D sensors. Now this is theory um, and this is life, I guess, okay? Because there's a lot of cross-pollination between the topics as well. It's only to be expected, especially for EMC here. I mean, that's um, typically a topic that comes on in many, that, 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 um, that really comes into many research areas. I mean, for instance, we worked on integrated 3D SPAD-based cameras, but we also had to fix some EMC problems in there. So we wanted to design, uh, in particular, we wanted to design DC-DC converters on chip uh, with a very low emission, so as not to disturb the working of the cameras and, and the sensor. Right, so a couple of ways to start a presentation about EMC. Well, actually two that I know of. Perhaps if you find a third one, you tell me. So the first one is actually to tell a, a joke. Now I leave you to judge whether it's appropriate or inappropriate. Um, I, I'm not going to read it out loud. It's a known joke. Um, if you go to an EMC conference or two, uh, chances are this joke will come up. So it's, uh, yeah. And it's actually good, a good way to introduce the topic because we all understand what it means, right? We all know this effect of taking, let's say, a cell phone and then placing it next to computer speakers and then, uh, you know, hearing that sound on the, on, on, on the computer speakers from the telephone and these things. Now, <clears throat> that's the informal way. You also got a more formal way, let's say, and you can actually describe an event that really did happen. And in this case, you could, or, you know, the anecdote or the, the, the occurrence that I put here on the slide is actually something that happened a number of years ago in England, in Lutton, actually very close to London, at the, at the north of uh, the city of London. And basically what happened there is that airplane pilots, which flew uh, and, and were looking to land or at, at Lutton or at London or basically uh, above Lutton, let's say, um, started to hear babies crying on their radio headsets, right, of the plane. 
So I've got little children at home. I got three of them. I can assure you, you probably don't want to hear a baby crying when um, when you're trying to land the plane. Definitely uh, not comfortable at all. And so, of course, if you do that, if you start to mess with radio spectrum, especially for uh, airplane traffic, then then of course the the yeah, they, they're going to to try to find uh, and yeah they're going to investigate. And this is what they did. And basically, they tracked it down and found actually that this source of of the baby crying. So on the on the airplane frequencies that the pilots were listening to was actually caused by, uh, let's say, malfunctioning. I'll put it this way: baby monitors, wireless baby monitors. Um, and yeah, that's a real occurrence, and that's a good way actually to start to talk as well. Now, a number of years ago, I was actually holding an EMC presentation, and and, and I decided to start with this anecdote. Now. Fortunately or unfortunately depends. Nobody likes to get difficult questions at the talk, but you know, there was an electronics engineer in the room. He was also an amateur airplane pilot. And then he said, how is this possible? He said, the airplane VHF band is located at, and I put the, put the frequency band here on the, on the slide, it's located at VHF frequencies. And baby monitors, well, they transmit at 49 megahertz. And by the way, this is entirely between brackets uh, as a as a student, you know, student talk. This is really interesting. Okay, SDR dongle. You can actually buy an SDR dongle. Costs a couple of tens of euros. Connect just a simple antenna. Actually, listen to all these frequencies. It's pretty amazing. Actually, it's not allowed. So to listen to frequencies, you're not supposed to listen to. But it it is very simple. I'm just saying this. But basically, to return to our story, the airplane pilot said, uh, the, so the electronics engineer who happened to be an amateur airplane pilot said, you know, how can one actually influence the other? Because they lie totally in different frequency bands. Now, the answer was nonlinear distortion. Okay, nonlinear distortion smears out the frequency spectrum. You get, basically, you get like, instead of a one single spectral line, you get like a forest of, of you know, frequency components. And we'll look into that uh, more in detail. Incidentally, if, um, if you do a bit more research about this occurrence on the on the net, you'll find that actually the the fault was actually the power supply. Okay, the switch mode power supply, which was shipped with the baby alarms. So you might think, oh, it's kind of a wireless function in the in the unit. No, it seems to be the origin of the problem. Let's say seems to lie in the power supply, the switch mode power supply. Definitely, switch mode power supplies, as we know, it can be quite a noisy. And in this case, actually uh, very noisy because even airplane pilots um, received them. So, yeah. Now, a couple of years later, history repeated itself. Well, Tasmanian EMC devil, that's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek. I used to work at Monash University, as Francois said, um, here, which is, uh, so that's Australia. Uh, Monash in Melbourne is about here, where the blue dot is. And here, this island is Tasmania. And so at Monash University, where I worked, I met uh, a cloud scientist. And I didn't know that existed, to be honest. But a scientist studying the clouds. I'm not talking about backup clouds, something like that, but real, like real clouds. And he was studying uh, clouds here in Bass Strait. Now, Bass Strait is like this, this piece of, um, how to say, it's like the sea between Tasmania and, and, and the southern coast of Australia. And... It's also an area that is known for very stormy weather as well. Actually, in the past, when people were massively emigrating to Australia uh, by boat and which took a long time, uh, many actually shipwrecks occurred there. Anyway, that's uh, beside uh, our story here. But he was actually studying clouds there. And he said, we've got a problem there because he rented a, a Cessna. And I don't know anything about planes. Okay, And you see the picture of the Cessna here. And he said, we've got four GPSs on board. Like you say, wow, this is overkill. But of course, he uses GPSs to track the clouds, right? So he wants to sell that type of cloud there, that height, and so on and so on. Okay. And all four GPS systems that were actually separate from each other, they all fell out when uh, the HF radio was switched on. Now you might say, hey, there's some sort of discrepancy because here, you know, previously you talked about the VHF band. Now you talk about the HF band. Um, yeah, apparently HF is required, and I don't know, he, he just told me that, so I believe him because I'm not an airplane pilot. He said HF is required whenever you fly overseas, so probably has to do with, with, with range or so of, of communication, I'm guessing, okay? 
And so by switching on, I mean, it wasn't transmitting or the pilot wasn't transmitting, just switching on the instrument and putting it on receive. And then we started to analyze this, uh, and this is my drawing here, so I apologize for the, the crudeness of the drawing. I'm not a good drawer. Uh, but uh, yeah, basically we started to try to track down where the problem was. Um, and, uh, and and yeah, well, it turns out the HF radio actually, they, they replaced it and we kind of lost touch after that. But it was still interesting actually to know that still, you know, nowadays, like a couple of years ago, um, you know, the, these issues, they, they're still around and also touching upon planes. Okay, so let's now talk a bit more um, about, um, uh, about technology and about how to solve these electromagnetic interference issues on PCB, let's say, when you use discrete components. Well, typically, when you've got an EMC problem, there's typically three things involved, right? So first of all, you've got a noise source. Noise source can be anything, can be a baby monitor, can be power supply, switch power supply, can also be a circuit actually, which is emitting, okay? And, 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 and you know that's the case, can be a circuit that is actually generating components, which are actually disturbing a receptor. The receptor could be, again, an analog circuit that is actually very susceptible to some form of interference. Now there's the channel in between, and this is typically the, you know, when you can't reduce the emission and you cannot do anything about um, the, the susceptibility of the electronic circuit, you're trying to shielding and do stuff with the coupling channel, right? Changing the coupling channel. Anyway, what happens on the on here, the receptor side, well, you take here an integrated circuit, take a certain pin, okay? It's connected to a PCB track. Now you get some conductor DMI, which can come from the noise source or let's say a circuit connected to it or something, okay? It also picks up just because of its length, can pick up actually radiated EMI and then all these EMI contributions sum and basically just, you know, get injected in the pin of that chip. Now, there's several works, actually, uh, very good references, and I listed a couple, but there's, there's many more. Um, just a, a couple of books that I know and that I particularly like. Um, and, and these references have investigated, actually, how you can increase the immunity to electromagnetic interference at PCB and system level. Now, we're just going to go through a couple, because there's plenty, just going to go through a couple of mitigation strategies that were out outlined in these works. First thing, we'll look at mitigating EMI issues through PCB layout, then through filtering, and then through balanced EMI injection. That's going to be a quick one. And then eventually using like feedback, like really circuit techniques. Okay, so let's let's step through these four mitigation strategies, <coughs> excuse me, one by one. Well, the first way is actually when you say, oh, I got a PCB, I got an EMC problem there. The first way, or the first thing actually you can do is actually fix the PCB layout. That's usually easier said than done. Um, there's many things to say, but let's look at a couple of conceptual things. Well, first of all, okay, you see in the far field, you get this, this relationship between received power and transmitted power, okay? And that's actually the freeze uh, transmission expression, okay, which you see here. It involves the gain of the antennas, the antennas being the tracks on the PCB, and their gain, well, that's going to depend on their geometry and so on, okay? So the gain of, of the antenna, there you've got the wavelength and then the distance between the antennas. So all these things come into play. So based on that formula, let's, let's analyze again conceptually a couple of good things, a, a couple of things. For instance, when is a conductor a good antenna? Well, for that, actually, we define something we call the electrical length, okay? We simply take the length of the track, which is L, we divide it by the wavelength, okay? And that gives us the electrical length. Now, if the electrical length is very small, okay, if it's like, okay, if if if, if the, the, the length of the track is really small compared to the wavelength, it's going to be not a good antenna at all. Of course, when the electrical length increases, it's going to be more and more a better antenna, let's say, and more EMI is going to be picked up on that track and then transmitted to the circuit connected to that track, okay? Now these figures, okay, I took them from reference works. Um, it's it's of course something dynamical, okay? You have to see for yourself. Now when we look at electrical length, we can relate it to a couple of practical dimensions. So what I did here, actually, I went from small to big, 
okay, from IC tracks, which are very small, like, and you see the, the, the you know, the rough coarse range of, of these dimensions through bond wires, which are in the millimeter range, and then PCB tracks, which are longer, and external wiring, which basically can, you know, when you got systems interconnected like that by wire, can be very long wires. For EMI frequency here, I put like two corner frequencies of some specifications, for instance, for the temp cell and direct power injection. If there's time, we'll talk a little bit about that. But in any ways, these are frequencies that are important in the standard. I'll put it this way, okay? Because they're like, like two corner frequencies between which people and between which the standard is going to investigate EMI. Now here, that's an easy one. That's the corresponding EMI wavelength. And then of course we can calculate corresponding electrical length based on these dimensions, okay? Um, so what do we see here? Well, basically we see that EMI is going to be a problem for PCB tracks and external wiring. It's not yet going to be a problem for bond wires and chips themselves. Of course, if this boundary increases, if this boundary in the standard actually specifies higher and higher frequencies, then it may become a problem. But for now, actually, we need to focus at solving issues for um, on PCB tracks and the external wiring. Another thing is how far away is sufficiently far away, because here I said keep disturbances far away from controlling nodes. And we'll come to controlling nodes in, the, in, in a number of slides. Okay, so, you know, when you say keep it away, keep it far away, then it, it's meaningless. Okay, it's again, it's a bit like they say in English, how long is a piece of string? It's like, that's no good answer to that. So I've got here a little example, which I took from one of the reference works. Uh, I think it's very telling. So. First, let's, talk, let's start with an ideal antenna, okay? One point in space. It has an antenna gain of one and it doesn't exist, okay? It's a perfect isotropic radiator, okay? Like this, this, this dot antenna in free space. Now we can calculate the power density at any distance r from that, from that antenna. We basically take the equivalent radiated power and divide it by the surface of the sphere, which is englobing that, um, that, that point antenna. We find this this power density. Then we do, yeah, we do, I don't know if you can say that in English, but we do electromagnetism. We, we bring in electromagnetism. We, we, we bring in the electric field, the magnetic field. We know the impedance of free space. And then in the end, we calculate this, okay? So we calculate the electric field. Now, of course, equivalent radiated power, we can translate that to transmitted power provided we know the antenna gain. As I said here, we're gonna take it easy. We're gonna take an antenna gain of one. So what does it mean actually all these numbers and things and formulas? Well, it means that a 50 kilowatt FM station, okay, 1.6 kilometers away will generate this electric field, less than one volt per meter at the receiver side. So at a distance of 1.6 kilometers. Now 50 kilowatt FM station, that's already, big station, you know, like just before the talk, I looked up a little bit. Um, when I used to, Francois mentioned, I come to Bordeaux regularly. I used to live there for a while, there for a while. And um, I used to listen to Radio Nostalgie. Bon, I'm not making <laughs> publicity, nothing. Okay. But then I looked up actually uh, on the web and Radio Nostalgie uses a transmit power according to this website, if it's accurate, five kilowatts. Okay. Sounds reasonable, like technically speaking. And it's actually, uh, well, the Bordelais here, people living in Bordeaux will know, uh, it's on the other side of um, of the river, I believe, very close to the city center anyway, okay? So you see 50 kilowatt is already like powerful station. Well, okay, it generates uh, an electric field of one volt, well, less than one volt per meter. Now for a mobile phone transmission, say 600 milliwatts, okay, it will produce at one meter, from the receiver an electric field which is that much now these numbers are meaningless if you don't get like some ranges in mind but and these are like you know of course this depends on many factors but here have a look so you see digital circuits usually we say they they start being or they start risking being susceptible to rfi radio frequency interference starting from an electric field larger than 10 volt per meter 
analog circuits already a lower range. So from one volt per meter to 10 volt per meter range and then above, of course. So as you see here, actually, okay, a cell phone a meter away can actually generate a sufficiently high electromagnetic field, electric field, I mean, can generate a sufficiently high electric field in order to disturb analog circuits. And this is this is exactly, I don't have my cell phone here, but when we take the cell phone, we put it next to computer speakers, that's even closer than a meter. So it kind of corresponds to what we feel, what we know. Okay, layout. Okay, we discussed a couple of things conceptually. Filtering, that's next. So typically when you don't want something in electronics, you filter it. And where don't we want things? Well, typically we don't want interference at controlling nodes. Now controlling nodes for a bipolar transistor is it's based to emitter voltage for a MOS gets to source voltage. That's actually the, the node which is going to control the device. Now for an op amp, the controlling node is actually the differential input voltage, okay? So it, it depends what are, what are you looking at, like transistor level or like a block diagram level, like an op amp and so on. Now you can, of course, filter VMI if it's out of band. You can add a shunt, cap shunt capacitance and then you can here have a series element which can be an inductance, a resistance. You know, if you can bear the, the thermal noise, if you don't mind the voltage drop, could be a resistance. If you say, oh, this could be a ferrite as well. Okay, used to be very popular previously when, um, you know, solving antenna problems. Now we we all have internet and cable, so it doesn't apply anymore, I guess. Okay, but before ferrite used to, ah, you used to solve EMC problems like that with ferrite. Now, what I said about the system level, well, here, okay, this is something typically uh, you might see in a data sheet, okay? So you see, for instance, here, you see a difference amplifier, okay? And here, the type of RFI filter that you have at the, you know, to, to prevent, let's say, EMI from being injected in the inputs. Okay, so that's, uh, I said this uh, before, the series impedance, yep, can be ferrite resistor inductor, and then, you know, there's all discussion, like what do you want to use and where and how. But think about this, I mean, filtering, okay, filtering we can do, but it reduces the bandwidth. On the other hand, if you think about bandwidth reduction and you, you say, okay, in many circuits, actually we use feedback, then it becomes actually a very difficult issue to solve. Now, I'm just going to outline, again, from one of the reference books, um, I'm just going to outline a simple example that actually becomes more complicated as we go along, okay? And then showing actually that solving these issues at circuit level, it's not trivial, okay? It's not always like, like just, just easy. Okay, so we start with something simple. We start with a non-inverting amplifier. Just an op amp, take it an ideal op amp even, one pole op amp, okay, um, here, feedback resistors, um, and we've got, yeah, an input source, and we've got EMI, okay, where does it come from? Oh, could be, could be bad grounding on the PCB, could be, but anyway, we've got some VMI at the input in here, VMI2, which is injected, let's say, at the ground node of resist, of the load resistance, okay, or of the, equivalent resistance representing the load. So the question is, how do we filter both, and they're out of band, eh? these EMI sources are out of band. That's important to say. Once they're in band, then of course, if you filter, you lose your signal. So you cannot do that. So how do we filter these both EMI sources while keeping the circuit stable? Now, well, for that, you have to, yeah brute force calculation, transfer function, and so on. Um, okay, so what's the controlling node? That's the first thing actually to note. Well, the differential input here has a controlling node, okay? So we need to avoid EMI from, let's say here, you know, going to VID and here, like going and changing VID. And so for that actually mathematically, okay, I'm, usually I point to slides, but then, I find it disconcerting with an online presentation. I, so I, I use my pen, okay? If it's a bit messy, I apologize, okay? But the um, how do we um, prevent VID from being changed by EMI? Well, for that, we have to plot actually these transfer functions, okay? VID as a ratio and or two VMI1, VIT divided by VMI2. And if you think about it, it's 
pretty logical because inbound, of course, well, we're going to have the, the loop gain, which is going to be, okay, uh, large, okay? It's going to be large, depending on the feedback resistors and so on and so on. So that's going to attenuate VID divided by VMI. On the other hand, that's not a band that we look at because we just said EMI lies out of band. Otherwise, it's not going to work anyway, filtering, okay? Not in this way. And so, okay, uh, this is the pole frequency of the op-amp. So you start to get this roll-off, okay? What does it mean? Actually, it means that actually EMI is impacting, and look at here, this is the unity gain frequency. EMI is actually impacting VID more and more as you increase the frequency. And it's not surprising because just look at VMI one, it gets injected here. Well, here you got feedback, okay? And, and if you're, let's say, past uh, the unity gain frequency, like what your feedback is, it's going to be zero, let's say, okay? It's you, not, not related to VMI one. So that explains actually the shape of this curve. So our problem is actually filtering EMI, let's say here, okay? Past the bandwidth, but you know, get, getting rid of that EMI. Now, what's the easiest thing? Well, you say, okay, let's dimension. Of course, you need to dimension these things, but let's take capacitance and short at a certain frequency, short V plus and V minus. Problem is if you do that, so that works here, and you can see that I'll go a bit quicker, that works on an EMI perspective, it works, but the stability is being reduced because now you're going actually to introduce a pole, a second pole, okay? And we all know what that means. You take one pole, two poles, three poles, Okay, and then, and then your phase margin will go down and you might get instability. So here I plotted actually the, um, the feedback circuit, okay, seen from V out to, 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 to here, actually the entire feedback circuit, okay? And then you see actually that C1 is actually introducing a pole. So there's several ways of uh, solving a pole. Well, you cannot really say that. There's several ways actually of mitigating a pole. A popular way actually that we can do is actually trying to create a zero, which is going to match that pole. Okay, then we create a pole zero doublet. It's not as trivial because then you can get these wild phase shifts and you need to be careful, but in theory it's possible. Okay, so we can make a pole zero doublet. So we can actually put a zero here on top of the pole and then the roll off is still going to be straight. Okay, by, by being careful, but anyway. Question is, how do you introduce a zero? Well, you introduce capacitance C2. So you get C2 here. And then you say, oh, okay. So you solved the problem for VMI1, but you made it worse for VMI2 because look, you know, at AC frequency, high frequencies, okay? Then VMI2 can just leak through that capacitance and be injected on VID. And then same thing, you'll try to solve it. Say, let's add this capacitance. That's going to be a pole filtering VMI3, sorry, VMI2. And you need to add a capacitance to create a zero and so on. And look, compare this circuit conceptually even to this one, okay? To the non-inverting amplifier. The simple, like I can practically say the most, well, the easiest stop amp you can actually design, okay? With an op amp. Easiest amplifier you can design with an op amp. And so you get all these, these poles and zeros and interplaying and all this, all this actually to filter out that EMI because you get that feedback and otherwise things, um, or you might get into instability. The third thing uh, you can do and you find in literature is actually using balanced EMI injection. For instance, you can, for an inverting amplifier, replicate the feedback, and I'll go a bit quicker here, can replicate the feedback on this node and you see that here actually, this is an LT spy simulation I did, but Okay, we're gonna have not have sufficient time to cover the rest, so I'll, I'll go a bit quicker here. And so actually what you can do is replicate, as you see here, the feedback, okay? Basically what you wanna do is actually you wanna null the EMI contribution, again, on the controlling node, on VID. So that's, that's what you wanna achieve, okay. The fourth thing is actually using, it's actually a catch-all thing. It's using feedback, but it's using much more like circuit techniques, okay? Um, say you've got a wanted signal, which is differential, and say you got an interfering signal, which is common mode, and say that the EMI signal lies in band, okay? So it's it's overlapping with the differential signal, but it's common mode, but it's it's at the same frequency range. 
And then one example comes to mind, which is very elegant to find, it's ECG signals, okay? When you've got an electrocardiograph measuring ECG, okay? Uh, now ECG, typical frequencies, you know, from, from let's say very low frequencies to hundreds of hertz, let's say depends if you want to take more components, less, but let's say hundreds of hertz, is, okay, if that's a plural. And then uh, signal levels 50 microvolt to 5 millivolts, say. But the problem with ECG is actually the body, the human body is a great antenna. We've got about two square meter of skin. Some people more than others, I guess, but yeah, okay. So two square meter of skin. So that's just a great antenna. So we pick up as an antenna, we pick up the mains, okay? But we pick up all sorts of radio frequency interference as well. Now the mains is at 50 Hertz. It's going to be, in other words, inbound with the ECG signal. So what happens actually, how can you look at this from a schematic perspective? You get power line, okay? This is a, an American book, so American voltage, yeah? 60 Hertz, but doesn't matter. It's also inbound with ECG. And then it couples uh, capacitively here to the human body. And then how does the current flow? This current flows typically through here, through the right leg to ground. Because we're always going to ground, oops, we're always going to ground the right leg of the patient. Why? Well, precisely to bring down the common mode on the body, okay? Because what is the common mode voltage induced on the body? Well, that's going to be that current injected in the person times the impedance of the ground electro, oops, times the impedance of the ground electrode, okay? So let's say reasonable numbers, okay? In this case, 10 millivolt. The ground electrode and the other electrodes are going to have a resistance, let's say, of approximately 50 kilo ohm, if you approximate it like that. But the problem with that is it's going to be highly variable. Because now, look at here. It's between here and here. We want to measure the ECG signal. It's a differential signal, okay? The problem is that these electrodes are mismatched. You say, how come? I mean, it's the same type of material, silver, silver chloride. Well, because, you know, one side is, has a bit more hair, is a bit more sweaty, and the electrode is making a bit better contact and so on. You've got motion artifacts. So this, this, there's some mismatch, okay? Now, the problem is that, of course, mismatch converts the common mode, which is on the human body, to differential mode, which is at the input here of the electrocardiograph, okay? And this is exactly what this formula derives here. And then, okay, we can simplify, we can say that's the input of the electrocardiograph is equal to the common mode voltage on the body, which is because of capacitive coupling from the mains, that's going actually to be the imbalance between the electrode impedances between, in this case, left arm and right arm, divided by the inputting pins of the electrocardiograph. And so a couple of reasonable values, we find 40 microvolts. So 40 microvolts, if you recall, ECG frequencies, uh, sorry, ECG voltage levels, 50 microvolt to like five millivolt, like roughly. Okay, so 40 microvolt, definitely you'll, you'll know this. As you see, well, this, unless people invent a better type of electrode, we cannot do much about this. We can, however, try to increase the input resistance of the electrocardiograph. And this is usually where integrated circuits, people jump up and say, hey, hey, why don't you use CMOS? <laughs> you know, why? I mean, five megaohm is ridiculous. It's very low as a resistance, if you think about this. However, it's not the circuit itself. It's the, it's the context, you see? So first I'll say, it's not the problem is not the common mode voltage on the body, it's a common mode to differential mode voltage mismatch because of the imbalance in the electrodes. But can we increase that in? No, we cannot, even using CMOS. Why? Because typically for the specs, for guaranteeing patient safety, we need to include some serious resistance, typically around, around 100 kilo ohm. This is in case something goes wrong in the instrumentation amplifier here, the, 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 the device, okay, there's something like you connect to a certain voltage and you want to minimize the current flowing to the patient. Now, we had a certain capacitance as well to reduce the bandwidth for the thermal noise of the resistance. Secondly, the resistances. Secondly, for filtering the EMI, which is received on the human body. Okay, so, so we get here, yeah, 100 kilo ohm for the resistors. 
So we, we try, let's say we take a cutoff frequency for kilohertz, we get this capacitance, okay, and then you can calculate and it yields an impedance close to 8 megaohm at 50 hertz. So you see 8 megaohm, it's not far from what is written here. So you cannot increase it. And then think about this. You could say, okay, why don't you increase the resistors by a factor of 100 and decrease the capacitance by a factor of 100? And the answer is going to be thermal noise because that way you keep the cutoff frequency, the bandwidth for the noise the same, but you increase the resistance. So you're going to have a big um, problem with the thermal noise. And that's also these things are also not just like that. They're also tabulated into specs like these noise limits as well. So you're stuck. Okay, so you're stuck for, for increasing the Z in. I mean, what can you do? Something that analog design people have been using for many, many, many years common mode feedback. Typically, you connect the right leg of the patient instead of connecting it to ground, okay, like we did, like, like here, like, like here. You connect it to a common mode feedback. For ECG, we call it driven right leg, okay? And that's actually, actually that's going to do an impedance transformation for this resistance. It's basically going to be the same effect as with a Miller capacitance, okay? You're going to lower that impedance. You're going to, to actually measure the common mode on the voltage here, amplify and invert it, and then it's going to make that, um, that, that right leg electrode appear as if it's more than it is, okay? And that's going to be a better ground connection and reduce the common mode on the voltage. Because by reducing the common mode on the voltage, you get less common mode to differential mode distortion, etc., etc. So it works. Unfortunately, this approach doesn't work. Well, it works at 50 hertz, but duh, 50 hertz, it's like DC for, for electronics. Uh, easy to make a circuit actually that, that can take out 50 hertz in a way like this with a common mode feedback. Problem is EMI might be much higher in frequency. For instance, here, this is a problem we investigated. LVDS transmitter, low voltage differential signaling, okay? I know here I'm jumping from PCB to, to integrated circuit design, but bear with me. I mean, it, I feel it matches well in the context of, of, this, of this, okay, of feedback. Well, you see here, you got actually two current sources, sourcing thinking, and then you got switches, which are actually going to direct the current to a certain termination resistance at the receiver side. Now that termination resistance and the direction of the current, excuse me, are going to cause differential voltage at the inputs of the receiver, okay? And that's going to be the way you transmit information. Now there's a common mode feedback loop and I've got a picture here. Yeah, that's a common mode feedback loop here. It's actually going to here do feedback the common mode. So you see you measure the common mode here. Okay, so in order to bring the, the common mode, the bias voltage on the, on, the, on the transmission lines to, let's say, a reference level, okay? So like, let's say mid-supply, something like that, okay? Now, along comes EMI, because this talk is about EMI. So EMI gets, for instance, injected in these very long or just long differential um, transmission lines. Now here I represent it with a resistance in series with a capacitance. So it's basically a model for direct power injection. It's the way of, it's a way we used to couple EMI into a circuit, okay? And it, 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 the, the, the thing here, I, you know, I wanna know this, you know, this looks like, okay, you just, just couple EMI. You have to realize that by doing this, actually you're messing up your simulation too. So you cannot simulate your LVDS transmitter at higher data rates because here actually you've, uh, you've capacitively loaded these transmission lines as well. So you, so it's always a, a thing like, am I going to add EMI? But then, yeah, but then I can't test, okay? It's like you say, let's investigate and let's inject EMI in an oscillator through a capacitance, and then and then you change the capacitance of the oscillator, it oscillates at a different frequency. So it's kind of a chicken or egg problem, okay? Um, now, due to the non-linearity of the LVDS transmitter, part of that common mode EMI is distorted to differential mode EMI. And there's basically two effects. I'll just go very, very briefly through them. Okay, first thing actually you've got here. Okay, so you get EMI, which is injected common mode here on the transmission lines. Now, the first thing actually that you, so you get this large common mode here. This is going to distort Okay, and pull outside of the operating region here, the current source transistors, okay, the current source and the current sink. 
Secondly, EMI is totally going to mess up here at high frequencies. The common mode feedback won't follow. And so EMI is going totally to the bias, the common mode feedback actually uh, of, of this circuit. And that's going to cause many problems. So as we've seen for the PCB design, and I've got about five minutes left for the presentation. So we've seen for the PCB design, we mitigate this by layout. That was the first thing. By filtering, so removing EMI before it reaches a controlling node, we've seen like base to emitter node, gate source node, or differential input for an op-amp. Balancing EMI injection, okay, that we've been very quickly. And then circuit techniques, catch all. Catch, catch all category, like feedback. But well, we've seen only feedback, but it's probably different type of techniques. But using, for instance, common mode feedback, using ways to, okay, attenuate that common mode EMI. Let's now spend a couple of slides on extrapolating these EMI issues to integrated circuits. Basically, we're going to have two issues in an integrated circuit, very conceptually. We're going to get some EMI injected in a circuit. Uh, we're going to get nonlinear distortion. Why? Well, because transistors are nonlinear. Okay, so we're going to get nonlinear distortion, which is, yeah, here you see, you know, one frequency component here, several. Then here we low pass filter that why do we low pass filter? Well, could be could be intentional, could be a filter present there, could also be a pole, or it could also be a parasitic pole. In the end, we're always going to have reactive components doing some sort of filtering. Now, the thing that you note here in the spectral lines, so you go from one spectral line, let's say a pure sine wave. You go to several, this forest of spectral lines, and then by filtering, the worst case, you retain the DC component. This means that you're creating a DC component in your chip, which has the potential to even debias the rest of the circuit. Okay. So let's look at these two blocks, nonlinear distortion. Okay, so here, and low pass filter. So let's start with nonlinear distortion. Conceptually, very easy to see as circuit designers. You've got, for instance, take a diode or a diode connected transistor, doesn't matter, like even a diode will do, a simple diode. You inject some form of DC current, some fixed DC current, I mean, and on top of that, and superposed to it, you inject the sinusoidal EMI, okay? Now what you will see here, you know, you get this, this nice sine wave here for the current. And of course you see that the operating point, okay, original operating point that you have here will shift just because of that nonlinear distortion. That's that's exactly what I said here, you know, all these spectrum components that are being created. So it shifted, you see actually the shift of your DC component happening there. Now the way you can model actually that the IEMI as sine waves, AM waves, okay, and then yeah, I won't go deeper into here. This is, for instance, just an illustration showing that you get, yeah, two signals actually cross-mixing, okay? And then you get, like, basically, you get spectral components everywhere. And then, yeah, this is actually the baby monitor, for instance, right, in the play. So it comes to the audio frequency, other type of frequencies. That's, that's really the issue, actually, in, in these things. Low-pass filtering makes it worse because it picks out the DC component and throws out the high-frequency components. On top of it, it can be much worse, much, much worse than actually a simple distortion analysis, you know, the type we do, pen and paper, that couple of small signal simulations. It can be much worse, actually, than such an analysis predict. And this is the last two slides, and then I'm finished. Best way I feel to see that is to use a very simple circuit, the source follower, okay? So we get here DC voltage at the input, get resistive load, and then say a capacitance, okay, which is going to form a filter at this node. On top of the input, well, superposed to the input, we're going to have the sinusoidal EMI signal. Now, let's look at the plot simulation. Light green here, well, now I'm coloring it blue anyway, okay, that's going to give us the DC level when no EMI is present. When we add some very low frequency EMI, we're going to get here the blue sine wave, okay? Now, I'll tell you this, this blue sine wave, it is nonlinearly distorted. But to be honest, when you look at it like this, from the schematic, it looks very clean. I mean, it looks very nice. You couldn't actually almost make out the nonlinear distortion. What does it mean? It means that actually there is some form of DC shift, like we've seen here, like here, okay? But it's going to be very small. Okay. But that's for low frequency EMI. 
if you increase the frequency of EMI at a certain point, well, this is going to become a low pass filter. And when that happens, actually something hits the fan because what happens now is you've got nonlinear, uh, non-symmetrical charge and discharge paths. Indeed, you charge the capacitance through the transistor, you discharge it through the resistor. What you get here, basically because of this asymmetry, you get this very large DC shift. Look at this. I mean, that's that red, you know, and I stopped the simulation here. That's that red um, curve. So you see, actually, it has the potential to really change the DC voltage at that node. And the only difference is basically the cutoff frequency of that filter. Okay, that's going to define it. That's the cutoff frequency. That's going to set, actually, that limit. Okay. And this is basically repeating what I said. Look, the blue one, that's all nice. It's got a certain average, okay, but it's it's small. I mean, there's going to be almost no difference with the light green one, but the red one, that's an entirely different story, okay? And there's actually interesting papers investigating um, like slew rate effects, like asymmetrical slew rate. Um, and then because of EMI, because of this asymmetry, actually you, the entire circuit messes up. So. The take home message, accumulated DC shift on the output can be way larger and so way worse. Okay, this is uh, basically the conclusion of my talk. So what did we do? Well, next time if you have to give an EMC presentation or somebody asks you nicely, like what happened here, there's two ways you can start it. A formal way, an informal way, but beware if there's a pilot who's also an electronics engineer in the room. You know, nobody likes getting difficult questions, I guess, during presentation. So if you're, yeah, I mean, this is this is obviously a joke. It really happened, though, okay? But but you can pick, okay? Uh, second thing, um, we discussed EMC circuit-based issues on PCB, EMI, actually. EMI circuit-based issues on PCB. So layout, we looked at very conceptually. Filtering, beware of filtering and feedback, right? Because that has the potential to really mess up your stability pretty bad. Balancing and then feedback circuit design techniques. And then we discussed very briefly a couple of specific issues on chip. Okay, nonlinear distortion plus low pass filtering equals DC shift. So that's it. Thank you again for uh, inviting me. If uh, I'm seeing the YouTube screen here, so I'm seeing a couple of questions. So I'll, I'll be happy to answer and, and discuss with you. So. So thank you, Professor Jean-Michel Redoute, for your nice presentation. This is a very interesting presentation to learn about design uh, of analog and digital circuits that are exposed to, to AMI interference. So I, I would like to ask you some questions uh, from the public and then from myself. So first, um, a question from Professor Francois Rivet, which is: We have more wire, we have more wireless communications, IoT, 5G, more and more directional and powerful. Do you think it is more risky for our electronics than for our health, especially for critical applications? Well, investigating the effect of uh, electromagnetic fields on health is also a very interesting topic, actually. Um, it's, uh, for instance, when you look at electronic implants, I know I'm, it's not like I'm changing the topic, but IoT 5G definitely, I mean, they're not yet, at least in implants, okay? But let's say for an implant, uh, you, 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 let's say you, you transmit things, so an implant is in the body, and typically you need to monitor, actually, there's some specs about that, like specific absorption rate. Uh, very important, actually, if you've got implant, but very important for cell phones as well. So, for instance, there's limits, like emission limits, okay, for a specific absorption rate. Now, where do these uh, specs come from? It's, it's not my field. Um, but, you know, perhaps we'll all switch to optical and then there won't be EMI anymore. So, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay, the second question is from Ayub Aitida. Uh, how safe are the medical devices embedded in the human body against EMI generated by surrounding electronic devices? 
Do you mean, Ayub, do you mean the, um, the, the fact that implants could be disturbed by electromagnetic interference? Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. for example, these makers, I think. Um, definitely, um, but there's severe specs as well. Typically for biomedical, we worked on a project actually, uh, was not implanted, but actually a chest-based patch, right? We were working on this with microsys, and uh, you, you'd wear the patch here. Okay, I can't see myself on the screen, but you'd wear it on your chest, and then mm -hmm. it would measure a couple of parameters like ECG, uh, temperature, uh, try to derive blood pressure and so on. So I know we had to do a, a battery of EMC tests actually, and, and probably in case it gets commercialized, needs to be a lot more. So I think I think the specs and the, the let's say the validation process, I think it goes to great lengths actually to make sure that it's really safe because you don't want something to malfunction actually, of course, obviously in the, in the body, so. Yeah, of course. So, well, next question uh, from Denis Flores. Thanks, Professor Retute, for your presentation. In the context of data transmission, example, CANVAS, is the transmission of a dominant bit carried out in common mode or differential mode? Oh, thank you, Denis, for the comment. Um, the, um, I worked on Linbus, but uh, CANVAS I haven't worked yet. So I think, but I might be totally wrong. I think it's a differential scheme. So I don't know, actually, to be honest, for sure. So I don't know. I'll, I'll pass this one. <laughs> I'm sorry. OK. And then from, also from Dennis, what is the best representative injection mode for a practical situation, considering added disturbances? Yeah, Dennis, that's a good question. Uh, the, um, the um so there's a couple of specs right so the easiest for a circuit designer i find you know when we design in spice or integrated circuits it's to inject through a capacitance uh because we something we can control however like with the lvds transmitter it can really mess up the operation of your circuit itself and so doing also these measurements adding a capacitor boom injecting emi i i haven't shown these slides but but the, the specs about that, it's also very straightforward. But it, if it messes up the operation of your circuit, then you're nowhere, of course. So you can also use, for instance, a, a, they call it a TEM cell, transversal electromagnetic cells, about, it's a box about this size. You put your chip on a PCB, it has a certain, uh, the PCB has a certain um, dimension, it's about 10 by 10 centimeters. And then you flip it and you put it with a, with a chip and the electronics inside the box. And then that's way that way you can actually it's a miniature uh, EMC chamber if you want okay so you can actually look at how injecting the EMI and it gives you a very nice um, measurement this way because there you really get actually that interference which is getting received by the PCB tracks and then transformed uh, into uh, into conductive EMI okay and that messes up then your circuit okay on the other hand. The difficulty then is how are you going to measure or how are you going to model the TEM cell in SPICE? Because then it becomes more complicated. It's an entire electromagnetic environment. There are several papers actually and several researchers actually having done research on this, but um, it's not as easy as putting a capacitor. So I guess um, I guess it depends uh, then is on the application, I guess. Uh, so if you can inject simply, like let's say in the supply of something, boom, capacitively, then fine. Otherwise, you know, might, you, you might not be able to just inject through capacitance. Okay, okay. I have a question re regarding to that. Um, for example, when you try to model the electromagnetic interference, the EMI in a, in a circuit, do you use any special software for the level of for example, integrated circuit design, for example, I'm designing a ship and I need to model the electromagnetic interference in, in for example, in the inputs on an of an operational amplifier. How do you manage that using a specific software or, well, instead of the SPICE model, uh, do you use also an electromagnetic simulator or something like that? Um, not me. Um, because I'm, 
I'm a circuit designer, actually. I look at EMI as being a source, and then I try to solve it in SPICE, or at least I try to understand where the problem is coming from, and then I get a feeling with SPICE. So I, I kind of make abstraction, abstraction on the way uh, EMI gets, in this case, converted to, let's say, conducted EMI, and as you say, the input of a certain uh, integrated circuit like an op-amp. Okay, so I, I kind of make abstraction about this. I know that other research as well, but then it becomes more electromagnetism, I guess. So it's it's more than, yeah, electromagnetic solvers, uh, modeling, let's say, simulating the TEM cell in an electromagnetic solver is uh, something that a PhD student has, uh, has done very recently, actually. Uh, and, and then trying to match this to, to some SPICE simulations for a particular case. So so it's it's not trivial. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think so. Um, yeah. yeah, I have another question uh, regarding the, for example, for the supply voltage. The supply voltage is also as, uh, an input of the of my circuit. So what happens, for example, if I use a single supply for the operational amplifier, and, and for example, I would like to reject all the interference, the EMI, in my circuit, do you have any strategy, for example, in a PCB or something to design the, the power tracks in order to reject the electromagnetic interference? Yeah, it becomes really a PCB problem then. Eh? If you solve it at a PCB, then it becomes really a... There's several layout techniques eh? as well, like, like several, you know, um, for, for strategies, not, not like one or two, but really really studying actually the, the behavior, looking, for instance, the reference works I used for preparing this talk, actually, they're mostly targeted at, um, at PCB and cable harnesses, like really the exterior, but also the PCB. But uh, on, on a chip itself, let's say you design an amplifier or something like that, then really becomes actually the same issue as power supply rejection ratio, I suppose. So so for that, we it's something as integrated circuit designers, we know, well, like, we, we, you know, we need to find mitigation strategies and, and design, but we, we can actually derive, and it's something that we use already as a um, as a metric. So it's on, for that for power supply rejection ratio, it's not different actually from EMI injected in a single rail supply or 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 a noisy substrate. It's also something that we know as designers when you do like low voltage, uh, like uh, you know. So 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 from that perspective it's not so different actually from circuit design actually the it depends on exactly how you solve the problem but it gets actually very close to each other yeah 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 emc and circuit design i mean so yes and also i have another question uh, for example you you need for your application you need an operational amplifier that use you, you have like five different encapsulations five different packages yep how for example, is there any specific package that you can uh, for, you prefer for for the application for any compliant EMI compliant uh, circuit, for example, or you do you or the package is not influent into the EMI interference? Uh, how 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 do you choose the package or or the application? Do you need uh, do you have some specification for the package? Um, the package is also studied in EMC. Eh? It's not it's not my field of research, but it's a, an important one. So actually, if you, for instance, in the IEEE transactions on advanced packaging, the name is, the exact name escapes me, but it's advanced packaging and, and something like that. The you you see actually EMC papers also appear or type of EMC related papers appearing. For myself, for op amps or uh, like particular circuits, um, not, I, I, I'm not looking at that, but obviously you try to minimize track lengths, uh, you know, like like bond wires getting close together. So you, yeah, the, all these things of course are going to influence. Yeah. But I've, once I, uh, I've attended a talk from actually the author of one of the reference works and he, uh, he was talking about actually even, cause we always say, oh, you know, if you decouple a chip, like you put the big capacitance and then small, 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 and then you know at the at the very pin you put the smallest one. And he said actually he related that to package. So he said, oh, and then that so there's actually studies about that as well. So it has of course a big influence, package, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I think so. So also, um, for example, if you, use, if you use an operational amplifier for your application, for example, for ECG or well, something like that, do you have which parameters of the amplifier, which specification of the amplifier is it's important to choose, for example, well, one is the power supply re rejection ratio, I think. Mm -hmm. The other is the, well, the offset voltage. Or, and well, there are a list of parameters where you see a data sheet of a, yep. a operational amplifier. Which parameters are the most important for you uh, according to the application to design a EMI compliant uh, application? Depends on the on the application at hand. For instance, you talk about the instrumentation amplifier. So, for instance, the well for the ECG problem or the electrocardiograph. Yeah, you would, example, uh, instrumentation yeah. amplifier. For yeah. Instance. yeah. So you would you would look there at uh, at uh, at implementing the driven ride. Like might even not be a problem actually in your application if the ground uh, electrode is good enough. So it depends on the case per case. Um, it's hard to say like that, that and that and that. Obviously, as you said, um, like power uh, supply rejection ratio, definitely uh, differential uh, common mode to differential mode distortion conversion in that circuit block. Although most of the time, well, most of the time I don't know. But for the electrocardiograph, that problem happens outside. The chip is it has not, you know can have a CMRR which is very high. That instrumentation amplifier. But the problem actually happens before. It's when you you get these imbalances. So, but CMRR in general is something you need to watch out for. Typically, when you get differential signaling, you get EMI, and then you get you know differential. Um, oh well, common mode to differential mode distortion, like in the LVAS transmitter. Okay. Okay. And another question that is like uh, like for me, I don't work in this area, so. It's interesting to me, and I saw that in your slide, you show that the third electrode for the ECG, you place into the left left leg, right? A right leg. A right leg, so, yeah. so why, why is that? Why do you place, for example, why don't you place, for example, in another, in another part or in, yeah. why is that? It's because, uh, I think it's because the way ECG was evolved. So in ECG is actually quite old. It's, um, uh, you know, end of the 1800s. It's uh, Eindhoven, I forgot his name, his first name. But anyway, he was a Dutch uh, physicist, so physician. I mean, uh, physician, and he used, uh, and you see a picture actually on, of him on the net, and he puts his, his hands like this in buckets of salt water because there were no electrodes, and he puts his left leg in a bucket of salt water as well, or saline solution. And so that forms a triangle, and so they started from that Eindhoven's triangle. After that, people started adding more electrodes and measuring all these leads. But I guess they take the right leg because it's the limb that is not used. So for the Eindhoven triangle, you do both arms. So yeah, it could be shoulders, could be arms, I guess. And then the left leg. And so the right leg is not used. So I think out of formalization, for instance, when you go to the hospital, you have the standard 12 lead ECG. There is this, it's very, people know exactly where to place the electrodes. And so they have a good point of comparisons between different ECGs that are taken. The right leg, to my knowledge, is always used for a reference. In that system, so okay, then, then, okay, that that's good for me because I don't know too much about this topic. So it's uh, also the last question is uh, for for myself. I I, I hope there are more people from the public ask some more questions. Um, why uh, do you prefer in the ECG? Well, well, for example, in the EMI compliance solutions, do you prefer using a a supply, a dual supply voltage or a single supply, for example, VDD and ground, or instead of plus VDD and minus VDD for the for the application. And well, and my other question is about the, the output. For example, um, normally I see in normally I see that the applications have a single-ended output. Um, it 
it's better to have a differential output as well, or that, for example, in the based on your experience, it's better to have a, a, different, a differential output to a, instead of a single-ended for for some applications, because I see that managing differential, fully differential outputs is also very, very complicated at the level yeah. of circuit yeah. design. So, well, well, from an EMI's perspective, differential will be better because of, of course, if the EMI injection is very, very strong, like let's say for the LVDS transmitter, it's really like overpowering the 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 you know the circuit itself, and then creating nonlinearity. Then, then then uh, then yeah, then 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 it doesn't help. But normally, differential will be better. You'll be able actually to differentiate between your signal, which is weak usually most of the time. Which is differential and then common mode. As to the dual power supply rail and uh, or the single supply rail, I can't see like right for now. I can't see a a benefit either way. I think I think in any case the way I would look at it, but I would look at the application, see what is required in that application, then try to fix it. So try to solve it. That might involve changing the supply, perhaps. Um, but like from that, like this, I don't know. Whether one would always be better than the other, I mean, or something. It, de I, it, it depends on the application. Yeah, 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 sure. For example, a battery power application is better, obviously, the single ended supply. Um, with that, you mm. continue. Okay, for me, that's, that's all the questions I have. Uh, uh, well, uh, I think there are no more questions from, from the public. So I would like to say thank you again. This is a very, very interesting presentation for me, for example, and I think for the rest of the participants, because it's very, very, very a very important subject that it's outside the chip and outside the, with the interaction with the real world. So I think it's very, very interesting to consider it when designing circuits. So thank you very much again. Thanks and a lot. Hope to see you again in the next talk. Definitely, definitely. Hope to see you face to face. And um, to all the listeners and people listening, uh, keep well. And I see a lot of us work from home still. So let's hope, uh, let's hope, you know, one day soon, everybody will be able to resume, go to the office and yeah. Fine. Yeah. This our situation. I mean. Yes, yes. I hope uh, this is a very, very important, very nice talk. So thank you again. So for the for the public, I would like to remind you the next um, conferences from the from the IEEE from the IEEE uh, branch. So remember that the next week we have a um, professor Choi from Korea. Uh, in a very interesting talk about green oscillators and PLLs. And then uh, Friday 4 December, uh, we have uh, also Victor Greenblatt from Synopsis in Chile. It's a very important and very interesting talk as well. And then um, from the CAS Rio Grande do Sul chapter, uh, from Professor Yar Rabai in November 27. So please stay tuned. Thank you so much. And see you in the next talk. Yes, thanks a lot, Andres. Okay. See you all, I can just disconnect. Okay.